Hey everyone, thanks a lot for taking your time to join this webinar on three steps to maximizing impact with machine learning. I am Gio, I work as a product manager for Glovo. Glovo is a super app uh, that gives access to anything for their customers in their particular city. Uh, prior to Glovo, I used to work at Revolut, uh, where I was managing a team of data scientists, data engineers, um, uh, focusing really on anti-financial crime uh, machine learning models. Uh, prior to that, I used to work as a data scientist, and indeed, I did a transition from data science uh, individual contributor to product management. So during this uh, time, I'm going to share with you all how uh, I used my experience uh, in the product management and very specifically on uh, machine learning product management. So if you ask me like about my entire journey uh, as a product manager, uh, the key responsibility of a product manager, according to my experience, is uh, to make sure uh, right things are done at the right time. So it's all about prioritizing ruthlessly and thinking creatively how you can um, uh, give uh, um, amazing features that's going to deliver uh, a great experience to our customers and importantly for the business that is going to generate uh, revenue. So during today's talk, I'm going to cover mainly three aspects. So the first aspect is quite generic as a product manager. It's about problem definition and uh, some uh, strategies that I apply when I try to get into the root of the problem. And once uh, the problem is being defined, uh, I also look into like how you can mitigate the risk of um, machine learning models and, uh, and how you can bring innovation there. And finally, how you can deliver and measure uh, your impact uh, of the machine learning model by a data-centric product lifecycle approach. Um, uh, I think I want to start with this scenario where we all been there. We we read about of something. We somebody shared us an article, and when we got an insight, uh, first thing we did is we went to Google and searched for, "Hey, this is a solution, and we need to apply uh, deep neural networks because that's something trendy, right?" So uh, we all been there, and uh, that is like something that. I also have done in the past, uh, especially during my transition time from a data scientist into product management. I focus really on the solutions. And over time, it is something that I also thought myself how I can focus really on the problem. So getting to the root of the problem, I think that would be the first aspect that I'll be covering. And uh, important aspect of getting to the root of the problem is that uh, let's uh, do that uh, exercise of understanding how we can get in the route by assuming this hypothetical situation where uh, we had a recommendation engine, let's assume it's using machine learning, and we realize that the customers are not engaging with recommendations as expected. So there can be two mindsets here. You can be a solution-driven mindset or a problem-driven mindset. The solution-driven mindset will be like this. The DS team may conclude that, okay, we need to improve our or this metric for say map at K. So map at K is essentially saying the relevance of the recommendations or the items that you recommended. So they jumped into the conclusion that, okay, if the customers are not engaging us as expected, the problem is probably map at K. Uh, we need to work on it. We need to retrain our model. We need to improve this metric. So irrespective of what the problems root causes, we already have jumped into a conclusion. And, but now let's think from a customer perspective, what does that map at K mean to the customers, right? So does, do they know about this metric? Unfortunately, no, right? So what does it mean as a customer of your application that's using and interacting with the recommendations engine uh, means map at K? So it's important that you translate uh, a, every problem that you get, uh, e even if as a data scientist, to understand what is the actual behavior of the customer. So uh, I would say it'll reinforce this message that assumptions are cancer to any product. So especially uh, in product management, where ML is a core logic, uh, when ML K 
can have different, uh, you know, moving pieces, different parameters, and, and different input data streams and output data streams. Uh, it is uh, there is a tendency that you can assume a lot of things, you can assume the behavior, uh, but I would say that's like cancer to the product, and that can actually reduce the impact that you're going to bring to the customers when you are not getting into the root of the problem. Um, so how can we do that? So when we identify a problem or let's assume we have an insight, and I would say the first step that we need to do is the validation of the insight. So it could be a qualitative or a quantitative validation. So a qualitative validation is like, okay, we know that our recommendation engine is not uh, getting enough engagement. So we need to get more data about the users. So What's the funnel analysis look like? Uh, what is the interaction of user and what's the rate uh, with which they are interacting, how much time they are spending, uh, for instance, and what's the action they are taking afterwards and before. So uh, these kind of interaction data uh, could be useful. And we can also dig into different dimensions of qualitative analysis with the data we have uh, about the usage of users. And the important step is we also need to do a quantitative validation. So the validation would be like uh, maybe uh, speaking with a beta user who doesn't have any machine learning background or a technical background, just to ask this user about why are you not using and noticing the behavior, etc. So from the inside, post qualitative and quantitative analysis, you'll be able to generate something what we call as a behavior statement. And the truth is most of the data science team doesn't know about the context or, or not well informed about the context. They know what the recommendation engine is doing. They know uh, where it is placed in the app, for instance, but they don't know the behavior of the user that is expected and what is happening. So as product managers, to if you want to drive impact with the with the ML, it is important that you inform your data science uh, with the context. And I will explain the importance of context later when it comes to monitoring as well. So it is important that Let's take an example that we discussed earlier about map at K. So map at K, when you put that into a context, you can actually see the behavior of customers and how that behavior could be translated back into the metrics that we are measuring, right? So it's important that you inform your DS teams about behavior and it could be part up with a behavioral statement of the customer, like uh, when the customer is uh, uh, trying to do X and Y, and when they are interacting with the recommendation engine, they are doing so and so, so and it is expected them to do so and so. So this kind of behavioral statements, uh, it is important that you share and uh, um, make sure the data science team is well, well informed about it. Uh, so uh, it is essentially the, uh, one of the things that we can do as a product managers and we should actively share the behavioral statement and expected behavior and the current behavior. So uh, now once you have the behavioral statement established, uh, how we can uh, uh, come up into the solution or coming into solving the problem. So one thing that we did uh, in the past is we always insert directly uh, solving right away. We also have this brainstorming sessions where you, uh, the DS teams can come with different ideas uh, and it can be a exhaustive list and it can be a massive list. And then during the refinement as PMs, you map that behavioral statement and the ideas based on your size, complexity and the effort required and the return of investment. And finally, uh, you have a clear evaluation metrics. Uh, and this evaluation metrics is really important uh, because uh, sometimes um, some product managers, uh, I have seen that they just make the decisions right away because it's much faster uh, without informing others. So it's important, like one thing I used to do is, uh, I, I used to create like spreadsheets with different ideas and the evaluation criteria and what's the effort required, what's the impact you're going to create, and et cetera. So once you have the ideas, you need to refine with the team and also assess the, the different aspects and dimensions that you're going to assess. So you can have an evaluation metrics. And from that evaluation metrics, you can come into a translate, choose one idea that's going to uh, help you to solve the issue of uh, having less engagement with your recommendation engine. So uh, 
as PMs, it's important that uh, we need to earn every decision you want to make, right? So it is important that you share the evaluation criteria and you make inform the DS teams and you make sure that they are well aware why you went with this particular solution. And you also considered uh, their opinion uh, and uh, what uh, they were trying to uh, trying to share uh, with their ideas and how uh, that idea is being uh, chosen for implementation. So once you have this uh, one, this uh, this idea that uh, you have to potentially to solve that insight, uh, it's important that you also need to validate it, right? Uh, there are different ways of validation. I mean, in traditional approach, you can do experiments, uh, but sometimes in machine learning, it may not be that straightforward to do validation. So some previously uh, in the past, what I have done with my teams is uh, sometimes we checked with pre-trained models uh, so that data scientists can mock um, the, the performance or expected uh, outcome based on existing models. That's already trained for that particular use case, but uh, sometimes it's not that easy to find either. Um, for instance, we were trying to build a fuzzy name matching system and to find models out there uh, which is pre-trained just for that particular use case was quite hard. So we needed to break down that into even smaller pieces and we found some models for some particular aspect of the fuzzy name matching. Uh, so we were trying to validate it that. The other thing is the open source community is really big in machine learning, uh, in research as well. So you can try to see if there is any open source models that you can validate it with. Uh, again, you can see the performance, how it works with your historical data, et cetera. And importantly, recently, there is a trend towards AutoML. Uh, some of you may be familiar. If not, I recommend you to have a look. There are tools like H2O.AI that can help you to you know, quickly prototype and get validation. but um, it is not as easy as it sounds. You need to have uh, your, you know, data set, uh, cleaner, uh, uh, cleaning, cleaned ones, and pristine data is important here. And uh, but it may sound like it's a magic, but it is not really. So uh, we may need to put more effort to making this work. So. Uh, sometimes uh, it could be used. I have seen some of the data scientists in the community uh, using AutoML for quick prototyping while it is still something uh, quite early. So once you have validated uh, and once you have identified the solution, I think as PMs, what we need to emphasize is the importance of uh, focusing really on how we can deliver impact and not focusing really on fancy solutions uh, which uh, you could fetch attention and etc. So uh, here I'm speaking more about uh, making sure your solution doesn't create unnecessary dependencies uh, and it is uh, it works as expected and it could be uh, as simple in a way that you can even explain it to a, a five-year-old sometimes. And once you have defined your uh, from the problem from the inside, and then to have a idea that you have validated, it is important before that you start implementation, you need to minimize the risk. So uh, one of the ways that you can do is to uh, uh, minimize the risk as product managers is to do that with research. And I believe in the product life cycle, especially with machine learning, this is where the actual innovation happens. And I think it is important that we as product managers uh, make sure that um, we mitigate the risk of uh, any any failure or any customer impact uh, by bringing in innovations. So one technique that we used to do in, in financial tech companies where there is heavy governance, we used to do risk assessments for most of the products. Uh, while for less governance products, uh, I know in the industry there is a term called pre-mortem. Um, a lot of PMs are speaking about it, and uh, which is ideally essentially a risk assessment as well. So you are uh, one in risk assessments. What do you assume is you assume that your solution is in production, and then you try to create scenarios where uh, if it fails, uh, what's it going to be the impact, etc. So some examples are like. Some scenarios where we are assuming, uh, let's take the example of a customer onboarding solution that we were doing for Revolut. 
So if you onboard a customer who is part of any sanctioned list or money laundering list, it can be uh, it can be lead to a lot of different factors. Like our banking licenses may get revoked, we may get huge fines from revel, uh, regulators, etc. So let's assume that we deployed a machine learning model for this process. And what happen if um, we uh, we are not actually uh, performing as expected. So it means that we will onboard high risk customers like terrorists, etc., to the uh, to the financial uh, financial institution. So what's the risk of it? We assess this scenario with a data scientist, so they also understand the risk of the models that they are building. And what's the fallback strategy? What happen if the model fails and or the system is down? How will you uh, how will you still deliver the value to the customer? What will be the minimal rules that you need to implement, et cetera? And what will be the financial impact? So how much revenue you're going to generate? So if you're replacing an existing vendor, it means that you're going to save the cost of the vendor. Uh, or what happen if you get a fine from the regulator? What is the worst fine you can get? You know, that's financial impact is there. Then what happened if your model is performing? Is it in production, but it's not performing that really well? So they mean that uh, there could be some other, uh, you know, financial impact. So you need to define like at least the expected outcome and the impact as well. And importantly, we as we also were assessing reputation impact. For instance, what happened if the machine learning model uh, is biased to certain race, etc. So uh, these are some uh, some things that you can assess based on the circumstance with which you are operating. It is important that as PMs, uh, you work with data scientists to uh, uh, create scenarios and uh, choose the ones that's really important and try to make sure your solutions uh, meet that, uh, you know, mitigate that risks. So yeah, some scenarios we were assessing is like, uh, uh, for instance, we had this onboarding uh, machine learning model, and let's assume we create uh, we onboarded someone who was high risk. And imagine the since we are applying for a lot of financial uh, banking licenses, uh, if the regulator is asking why did you onboard a certain person, we we should be able to tell them the logic of the machine learning model and the decision and how it was made. So the during our discussion with data scientists, the solution they came up is to you know build a model that's quite explainable or having this explain, and we were logging the query that the model is receiving, the inputs, the outputs, and the decisions that are being made. So you can see that uh, if this risk assessment and this mitigation was not done, uh, the impact that the ML model is going to create is going to be quite different. And here, working closely with your data science team is uh, really critical because as PMs, we can bring in the scenarios and define it clearly for the data scientist. And it is important that you take their experience and expertise uh, in uh, coming up up with uh, defense mechanisms and mitigation strategies for this risk. Another example was like uh, how to make sure your model is not biased. So if uh, if you take an example of uh, of a let's say a selfie verification system or a etc. face verification systems, for instance, uh, we don't have uh, much data available for colored people. So. Um, the way this uh, matching uh, works may not be as good as for colored people. So uh, this means that there is a bias already when you are building the model itself. So uh, we need to make sure uh, we capture those. And in Revolut, uh, we, what we were doing is we assess the inherent bias uh, in machine learning models. And then we set thresholds to make sure that uh, if the if the if the model is exceeding certain threshold in production uh, based on the inherent bias, then it means we need to rework on the models. It could be on fairness. It could be on uh, you know uh, anything about discrimination, etc. So to make sure that your model is not biased to a gender, race, ethnicity, color, etc. So once you have done this risk assessment, you can I create very important high risk scenarios that the model should handle and data scientists can bring in their innovation here. And I believe that's how we cultivate research and innovation when it comes to problem solving. So I think it's 
the most critical aspect here to reinforce is that we never should assume the ML system behavior. So we shouldn't assume the system is going to behave like X and Y without doing any risk mitigation. And this risk mitigation exercises will help you to make sure that we don't assume a lot of factors about the machine learning system itself. Uh, we are going to go into the root of each and every aspect that is that may potentially uh, potentially create a downtime or any impact on customers. So one thing we also was doing is we were testing heavily. We were testing with pristine data that pristine is red and it's important that you have good quality set of data for testing and validation your model. So we had like uh, five strategies. Uh, we had validation set like uh, any normal machine learning model you validate it uh, or during the development against the validation set. Then we had historical set. So which means based on our historically logged predictions and uh, data that we have in the system, uh, um, taking in the seasonality, et cetera. So some models may be seasonal. Uh, if it's like travel related models, I have seen there is a seasonality in the bookings and the way the system is behavior. So you need to have historical set that is uh, tackling all these particular scenarios. And we had a benchmarking set. This may be hard for some of the machine learning models, while for some of them, it, it could be realistic to have a benchmarking set, uh, which where you can compare against uh, your model performance against the standard industry set or uh, benchmarking that you can use against uh, different open source vendors, for instance. Uh, then once the model is uh, dip, uh, is ready for uh, production, we shadow it in production. So the model doesn't make the actual predictions, but it is uh, logging the predictions. So and this has been evaluated. And finally, uh, we also do canary rollout. Uh, so instead of rolling out 100% globally, we we, choose, we make sure we roll out per city or we roll out it for traffic uh, um, in a gradually increasing way of traffic uh, per, per country or per market we were operating in. And the most important part, once you have the risk mitigated validation strategy set is to co constantly capture the measure of the impact. So, and here I'm speaking, I'll be speaking more about how you can uh, transform a model centric product life cycle into a data centric product life cycle. So uh, recently, Andrew NG, uh, who is the founder of deep learning.ai is really emphasizing on the importance of uh, how companies should focus more on improving the quality of the data while uh, focusing less on the retraining on the model. So retraining more on the data while uh, you can uh, improve the performance of the model by in building in high quality data set. So the strategy is quite simple that we have uh, done in the past as well. So uh, some of the models that we built, as you mentioned, as I mentioned, uh, were catering for regulatory needs. So we were we needed to have something explainable. So we didn't have much flexibility uh, to change the architecture. So we kept the same architecture while we improved the performance of the model by bringing in more uh, labeled training set. So uh, in this case, we were labeling data set manually. So as PMs, uh, you need to identify the data science needs uh, of what kind of data you require. Sometimes you need to acquire it, buy it, uh, or label it, uh, or uh, generally work with different teams to make sure this data is available for your data science team. And uh, once we were reiterating on improving the training set, then we also were consistently monitoring the data quality. So we have upstream systems and downstream systems that is uh, probably consuming and uh, we where we are also producing the data uh, that may affect uh, the quality of the business processes. Uh, so we need to have uh, consistent monitoring on uh, the data quality that we are receiving, the nulls, uh, the profiling and some statistics and alerts uh, set on this data quality. So as PMs, uh, I think that is quite critical that we also consistently monitor these dashboards to make sure that the inflow is uh, as expected. And as I mentioned previously, we were logging consistently the predictions. Uh, this could have a lot of importance. You can do analytics on top of it, and then you could use it for retraining. You could use it for validation. You could use it for prototyping. So it's important that you 
also work with your DS teams to make sure your predictions are logged uh, and uh, you could con consistently have dashboards that's actually monitoring the performance. And uh, that's uh, the fourth aspect is once you roll out your ML in production, make sure you have like uh, uh, ongoing real time monitoring on the against the ground truth data. So I know in some of the cases, the ground truth data comes in a bit late. So it is fine, but it needs to be still to be monitored and you need to have alerting set on this. And the important aspect of machine learning models, uh, I've seen models being monitored for precision recall, etc., uh, which is great, but it's also important that we crafted a behavioral statement in the beginning. It's also important that you actually monitor your machine learning model's performance in its context. So how can we do it in context? And some of the interesting metrics that you can use is drift detection metrics. So like data drift and concept drift. So thanks to Evidently, I mean, it's an open source data uh, drift detection uh, tool that you can use. Um, and in in Glovo, we, we are using a vendor called Mona. So they both are great vendors, but the important aspect here is the concept. So what is data drift? So essentially your um, the, over the period, let's say you trained a model, you deployed into a market, you now you're deploying into a different market. Uh, so the model haven't seen instances of that particular market. So now uh, you need to have some monitoring on this, right? So, so here the context is really being applied. The customer behavior is different in different markets. So now you can understand there is a drift in the behavior of the model. So it's important you set the alerts and it is it should be part of your maintenance work as a data science team that you have to allocate capacity to the maintenance team and uh, and once if there is a drift in the existing uh, existing models that you have in production you need to allocate capacity to uh, rework on this uh, and other thing is concept drift which is essentially the behavior of the market or the customer changes so let's say there is seasonality in models uh, as I said about travel, it can be seasonal even for uh, onboarding of customers. There could be seasonality if there is a campaign happening on certain markets, you can have a seasonality there. So, and the behavior also changes. So let's say during pandemic, we had a different behavior for customers, right? So you need to consistently monitor the drift in the, in the features and uh, the performance of models. And that is quite important uh, as product managers that we also have uh, dashboards and alerts uh, set to make sure your model is in the context of customers. So uh, irrespective of all this, it is important, all that matters is uh, how much revenue you're gonna generate. And this is the hardest part uh, of translating your, uh, starting with your basic model metrics like precision recall, your health metrics, and then going into context metrics like drift, et cetera, and then finally going into what is the revenue this is going to generate to the business, right? So in some cases, it's straightforward, like when we were doing automation related models, uh, we can say we are automating tickets. So we know the cost per ticket and we can see like how much um, how much is the is the model uh, saving for the business? So that's quite straightforward. Uh, while for some cases it's not that easy. So uh, the the most simplest way you can measure the impact is uh, create a scenario where this model doesn't exist uh, and see how the how the business is performing and uh, also the scenario compare it with the scenario where the model is existing. So you can see the difference in revenue and you need to consistently track this. Uh, this is way how you measure the impact. And finally, I think when we were trying to build ML, uh, introducing ML, uh, we never pitched the solution uh, to the business or to the stakeholders. We never told this an ML. What we told is uh, what the system that we are, the product that we are building, how it can bring value to customers and how much revenue it's going to generate for the business. So that's how we pitched it. And we never said it's a deep learning or a machine learning or AI. So it's, it's, I have noticed there is a tendency at sometimes we go in to pitch the buzzwords while it is also important that we focus less on the buzzwords while we focus really on as a business, what's the value you can bring to the customers and how much general revenue you can generate. So recap. Uh, so we started with 
having an insight and how we can define the problem, working with the data science teams to generate the behavior of the customers, and then uh, creating how we can quickly validate the solutions that we have, and then mitigating the risk with uh, risk assessments, uh, creating monitoring on this, and finally measuring the impact. So I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, and if you have more feedback or questions, uh, don't hesitate to reach out to me in LinkedIn or Twitter. Uh, I wish you all the best. Thanks a lot for attending. Thank you.